Hey, good morning, readers. How are you doing? It's me, Mr. Aaron's, in your computer. And today, I am going to teach you about another signpost. Um, last week, we learned contrast and contradictions. And today, we are going to take a look at a notice and note signpost that helps you understand why characters do what they do. And we're going to call this signpost Memory Moment. Okay, so let's get set up with everything that you're going to need. First, you need the Perks of Being a Wallflower book, of course. Let me show it to you. You need your book. You need this note sheet that says Memory Moment up here at the top. And you'll need a pen or a pencil because I'd like for you to take some notes as you watch me. So grab those things. Okay, a little review. Last week I told you that as you are reading your books, whether it's The Perks of Being a Wallflower or your independent reading books, the authors are putting in clues to help you understand the story, the characters, the conflict, all of that. The, the authors of these books do not do anything on accident. They do these things on purpose because they want you to understand and enjoy the book. So what I told you is that these clues are like patterns and there are similar clues in all books. And so if we as readers can learn what these clues are that we're calling signpost, uh, then we can learn to stop when we see them and ask ourselves questions to understand the book a little bit more. Today, the clue that we are going to be looking for is called memory moment. And so I'm going to show you what this looks like, talk to you about how it works in the perks of being a wallflower, and then you'll be able to find them when you're reading. So I want you to think about a memory that you have from your life. Do you have one? I'm thinking about my wedding day. I'm thinking about the birth of my children. Okay. Chances are that memory is strong in your mind because it signals something important that happened to you. As readers, we want to be on alert for the times when our characters share a moment of memory from their lives because it's likely to tell us something important, either about the character or about the plot. We like to pretend that the characters in our books are like real people and they have real lives. And so when they tell us a memory of something that happened from before the book, then the author is trying to show us that something important is being sh shared here. So we're going to learn to stop at those memories and figure out what they mean. So a memory moment is the point in the book where the writer interrupts what is happening in the story to show us the main character as he or she remembers something important. When we see the character stop to tell us a story, we need to ask ourselves, why might this memory be important? The answers that we come up with might help us tell something about the theme, which is a message in the story, or a conflict, or it might even help us foreshadow what is going to happen later in the story, which are all good things for readers to be doing. Sometimes the clue to the memory is going to be pretty obvious. Like you might see the character say, oh, I remember a time when, and then share a memory. Or um, they might say like, oh, in that moment, in that moment, it all came back to me. And then they'll share a memory. Or it could be a little bit more subtle or difficult to pick out. Um, here's one that we're going to see today in our book. My dad used to tell the story of. And then the character would share a story. Or this picture always reminded me of. And then the memory would be behind that. The key thing to look out for is if the character says memory, reminded, or remember. Generally, that's a good clue that they are about to share a memory and that it might be time for us to stop and ask, why might this memory be important? 
Okay. So let's take a look at how this works in the perks of being a wallflower. I'm going to begin reading to you on page 42. which is actually the start of part two. And we're gonna look for these memory moments together. Remember, we ended last week by reading part one together and Charlie seemed to be making some really close friendships with Sam and Patrick. Um, and he was really feeling accepted after going to that party with them. He was also starting to learn some stuff about his friends. So let's read and I'll show you what we do when we find a memory moment signpost. So here we go. November 7th, 1991. Dear friend, it was one of those days that I didn't mind going to school because the weather was so pretty. The sky was overcast with clouds and the air felt like a warm bath. I don't think I felt that clean before. When I got home, I had to mow the lawn for my allowance, and I didn't mind one bit. I just listened to the music and breathed in the day and remembered things. Ooh, I'm, I see one of the key words there. Things like walking around the neighborhood and looking at the houses and the lawns and the colorful trees and having that be enough. I don't know anything about Zen or the things that Chinese or Indians do as part of their religion, but... One of the girls from the party with the tattoo and the belly button ring has, a has been a Buddhist since July. She thinks about very little else except maybe how expensive cigarettes are. I see her at lunch sometimes smoking between Patrick and Sam. Her name is Mary Elizabeth. Mary Elizabeth told me the one thing about Zen is that it makes you connected to everything in the world. You are part of the trees and the grass and the dogs, things like that. She even explained how her tattoo symbolized this, but I can't remember how. So I guess Zen is a day like this when you're part of the air and you remember things. Now, one thing I remember is that the kids used to play a game what you would do is take a football or something and one person would have it and all the other kids would try to tackle that kid. And then whoever got the ball next would run around with it and the kids would try to tackle him. This could go on for hours. I never really understood the point of this game, but my brother loved it. He didn't like to run with the ball so much as he liked to tackle people. The kids called the game Smear the Queer. I don't really... I didn't really think about what that means until now. Okay, I need to pause here because I see Charlie has said one thing I remember and then he told me this story about him and his friends playing a game. So I'm gonna grab my note sheet because I think I have a memory moment and I'm gonna jot down my thinking. So here we go. You can copy my notes as I'm making them. This was page 43. <clears throat> okay, so Charlie remembers the kids playing the game Smear the Queer, and he remembers his brother liking it, and um, he tells me that he never really thought about the name Smear the Queer until now. So I found this memory moment. What do I do with it? I need to ask myself the question, why might this memory be important? Why would Charlie stop the action of the book to tell us this memory? Okay, well, let me think. Well, I think the fact that Charlie 
is thinking about the name of the story or the game tells me that Charlie is kind of maturing. It kind of helps me see that Charlie is growing up and he's thinking about the world. So let me write, write that down first. This shows Charlie is maturing. Um, as a child, he didn't really think that much about the fun recess game called Smear the Queer, but now that he has a close friend, Patrick, who is gay, he understands how hurtful and inappropriate that name is. I'm kind of beginning to understand through this simple memory that Charlie is growing up and he's learning what it means to be an understanding and a good person because he's thinking about how those words could be really hurtful to someone that he cares about, like Patrick. So let me try and get some of this down. I said, Charlie's beginning to understand what it means to be a good person and how to treat people kindly. So this memory moment is helping me to understand a little bit more about Charlie and um, how he is learning uh, about his world and about his friends. So that's a pretty good one for me to stop and pick out. Okay, you can pause the video here if you need to keep copying down the notes. But I'm going to go back to the book, and I'm going to continue reading, and I'm going to keep looking for other memory moments. Now, one thing to know, readers, is that you're not going to find a memory moment on every single page. So we need to be on alert for them, but it's not like you're going to see them, um, like I said, every page. We kind of just have to be aware that they are in the book and that they're going to pop up. Okay, so I'm going to keep reading, um, and we'll see if we can find another one. So I'm right here. Patrick told me the story about him and Brad, and how I understand, and now I understand why Patrick didn't get angry at Brad at the homecoming dance for dancing with the girl. When they were both juniors, Patrick and Brad were at a party together with the rest of the popular kids. Patrick actually used to be popular before Sam bought him some good music. Patrick and Brad both got pretty drunk at this party. Actually, Patrick said that Brad was pretending to be a lot drunker than he really was. They were sitting in the basement with some girl named Heather, and when she left to go to the bathroom, Brad and Patrick were left alone. Patrick said it was uncomfortable and exciting for both of them. You're in Miss uh, Brostronson's class, right? Um, have you ever gone to a Pink Floyd laser light show? Beer before liquor, never sicker. When they ran out of small talk, they just looked at each other and they ended up fooling around right there in the basement. Patrick said it was like the weight of the world had been let off their shoulders. But Monday in school, Brad kept saying the same thing. Man, I was so wasted. I don't remember a thing. He said it to everyone who was at the party. He said it a few times to the same people. He even said it to Patrick. Nobody saw Patrick and Brad fool around, but Brad kept saying it anyway. That Friday, there was another party, and this time, Patrick and, Bad, Patrick and Brad got stoned, although Patrick said that Brad was pretending to be a lot more stoned than he really was. And they ended up fooling around again. And Monday, in school, Brad did the same thing. Man, I was so wasted. I don't remember a thing. This went on for seven months. It got to a point where Brad was getting stoned or drunk before school. 
It's not like he and Patrick were fooling around in school. They only fooled around at parties on Fridays. But Patrick said that Brad couldn't even look at him in the hall, let alone speak with him. And it was hard, too, because Patrick really liked Brad. When summer came, Brad didn't have to worry about school or anything, so his drinking and smoking got a lot worse. There was a big party at Patrick and Sam's house with less than popular crowd. Brad showed up, which caused quite a stir because he was popular. But Patrick kept a secret as to why. Brad came to the party. Oh, excuse But Patrick kept the secret as to why Brad came to the party. When most people left, Brad and, Brad and Patrick went into Patrick's room. They had sex for the first time that night. I don't want to go into detail about it because it's pretty private stuff, but I will say that Brad assumed the role of the girl in terms of where you put things. I think that's pretty important to tell you. When they were finished, Brad started to cry really hard. He had been drinking a lot and getting really stoned. No matter what Patrick did, Brad kept crying. Brad wouldn't even let Patrick hold him, which seems rather sad to me because if I have sex with somebody, I would want to hold them. Finally, Patrick just pulled up Brad's pants and said to him, just pretend you passed out. Then Patrick got dressed and walked around the house to go into the party from a different direction than his bedroom. He was also crying pretty bad, and he decided if anyone asked him, he would say that his eyes were red from smoking pot. Finally, he shook himself out of it and walked to the main party room. He acted really drunk. He went to Sam. Have you seen Brad? Sam saw the look in Patrick's eyes and then she spoke up to the party. Hey, has anyone seen Brad? Nobody at the party had, so, few people went and, so a few people went and searched for him. They finally found him in Patrick's room, asleep. Finally, Patrick called Brad's parents because he was really worried about him. He didn't tell them why, but he said that Brad was really sick at this party and needed to be taken home. Brad's parents did come, and Brad's father, along with some of the other boys, including Patrick, carried Brad to the car. Patrick doesn't know if Brad was really asleep or not at that point, but if he wasn't, it was a good acting job. Brad's parents sent him to, a rehabilit to rehabilitation because Brad's father didn't want him to miss his chance at a football scholarship. Patrick didn't see Brad for the rest of the summer. Brad's parents never did figure out why their son was getting stoned and drunk all the time. Neither did anybody else, except the people who knew. When the school year started, Brad avoided Patrick a lot. He never went to the same parties as Patrick or anything until a little over a month ago. That was the night he threw rocks at Patrick's window and told Patrick that nobody could know, and Patrick understood. They only see each other now at night on golf courses and at parties like Bob's where the people are quiet and understand these things. I asked Patrick if he felt that he had to keep, his, keep it a secret, and Patrick just said that it wasn't, it wasn't sad because at least now, Brad doesn't have to get drunk or stoned to make love. Love always, Charlie. November 8th, 1991. Dear friend, Bill gave me my first B in advanced English class for my paper on Peter Pan. To tell you the truth, I don't know what I did differently from the other papers. He told me that my sense of language is improving along with my sentence structure. I think this is great. I could be improving on these things without noticing. By the way, Bill gives me A's on my report cards and letters to my parents. The grades on these papers are just between us. I have decided that maybe I want to write when I grow up. I just don't know what I would write. I thought about maybe writing for magazines, just so I could see an article that didn't say things like I mentioned before. As Blank wiped the honey mustard off her lips, she spoke to me about her hu third husband and the healing power of crystals. But honestly, I think it would be a very bad, I think I would be a very bad reporter because I can't imagine sitting across the table from a politician or a movie star and asking them questions. I think I would probably just ask for their autograph for my mom or something. I would probably get fired for doing this. 
So I thought about maybe writing for a newspaper instead because I could ask regular people questions. But my sister says that newspapers always lie. I don't know if this is true, so I'll just have to see when I get older. I did start working for a fanzine called Punk Rocky. It's this Xerox magazine about punk rock and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I don't write for it, but I help out. Mary Elizabeth is in charge of it, just like she's in charge of the local Rocky Horror Picture Show showings. Mary Elizabeth is a very interesting person because she has a tattoo that symbolizes Buddhism and a belly button ring and wears her hair to make somebody mad. But when she's in charge of something, she acts like my dad and when he comes home from, when he comes home from work on a long day. She's a senior and she says that my sister is a tease and a snob. I told her not to say anything like that about my sister again. Of all the things I've done so far, I think I like the Rocky Horror Picture Show the best. Patrick and Sam took me to the theater to see it on Halloween night. It's really fun because all these kids dress up like the people in the movie, and they act out the movie in front of the screen. Also, people shout at the movie on cue. I guess you probably know this already, but I thought I'd say it anyway in case you didn't. Patrick plays Frankenfurter. Sam plays Janet. It is very hard to watch the movie because Sam walks around in her underwear while she plays Janet. I'm really trying not to think of her that way, which is becoming increasingly difficult. To tell you the truth, I love Sam. It's not a movie kind of love either. I just look at her sometimes and I think that she is the prettiest and nicest person in the whole world. She is also very smart and fun. I wrote her a poem after I saw her in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but I didn't show it to her because I was embarrassed. I would write it out for you, but I think that would be disrespectful to Sam. The thing is that Sam is now going out with a boy named Craig. Craig is older than my brother. I think he may even be 21 because he drinks red wine. Craig plays Rocky in the show. Patrick says that Craig is cute and hunky. I do not know where Patrick finds these expressions. But I guess that he's right. Craig is cut and hunk hunky. He's also a very creative person. He's putting himself through the Art Institute here by being a male model for J.C. Penney catalogs and things like that. He likes to take photographs, and I've seen a few of them. They are very good. There's this one photograph of Sam that is just beautiful. It would be impossible to describe how beautiful it is, but I'll try. If you listen to the song Asleep, and you think about those pretty weather days that make you remember things, and you think about the prettiest eyes you've known, and you cry, and the person holds you back, and then I think you will see the photograph. I want Sam to stop liking Craig. Now, I guess maybe you think that's because I'm jealous of him. I'm not. Honest. It's just that Craig doesn't really listen to her when she talks. I don't mean that he's a bad guy because he's not. It's just that he always looks distracted. It's like you would take a photograph of Sam and the photograph would be beautiful. And he would think that the reason the photograph was beautiful be was because of how he took it. If I took it, I would know that the only reason it is beautiful is because of Sam. I just think that it's bad when a boy looks at a girl and thinks that the way he sees the girl is better than the girl actually is. And I think that it's bad when, when the most honest way a boy can look at a girl is through a camera. It's very hard for me to see Sam feel better, feel better about herself just because an older boy sees her that way. I asked my sister about this and she said that Sam has low self-esteem. My sister also said that Sam had a reputation when she was a sophomore. According to my sister, Sam used to be a blow queen. I hope you know what that means because I really can't think about Sam and describe it to you. I am really in love with Sam and it hurts very much. I did ask my sister about the boy at the dance. She wouldn't talk about it until I promised that I wouldn't tell anybody, not even Bill. So I promised. 
And she said that she's been seeing the boy secretly since dad and she couldn't, dad said she couldn't. She says she thinks about him when he's not there. She says that they're going to get married after they both finish college and he finishes law school. She told me not to worry because he hasn't hit her since that night. And she said not to worry because he won't hit her again. She really didn't say anything more other than that, although she kept talking. It was nice sitting with my sister that night because she almost never likes to talk to me. I was surprised that she told me as much as she did. But I guess that since she keep, she's keeping things a secret, she can't tell anybody. And I guess that she was just dying to tell somebody. But as much as she told me not to, I do worry a lot about her. She is my sister, after all. Love always, Charlie. Now this... This is kind of an, a contrasting contradiction that Sam's sister told Charlie another secret, especially because he told Bill last time. I'm going to keep reading because we're looking for memory moments. Okay, November 12th, 1991. Dear friend, I love Twinkies. And the reason I'm saying this is because we're all supposed to think of reasons to live. In science class, Mr. Z told us about an experiment where they got this rat or a mouse and they put the rat or the mouse on one side of the cage. On the other side of the cage, they put a little piece of food and this rat or mouse would walk over to the food and eat. Then they put the rat or the mouse back in its original side. And this time they put the electricity all through the floor where the rat or the mouse would have to walk to get a piece of food. They did this for a while and the rat or the mouse stopped going to get the food on a certain amount of voltage. Then they repeated the experiment, but they replaced the food with something that gave the mouse or the rat intense pleasure. I don't know what it was that gave them intense pleasure, but I'm guessing it was some kind of rat or mouse nip. Anyway, what the scientists found was that the rat or the mouse would put up with a lot more voltage for pleasure, even more for the food, even more than for the food. I don't know the significance of this, but I find it very interesting. Love always, Charlie. November 15th, 1991. Dear friend, it's starting to get cold and frosty here. The pretty fall weather is pretty much gone. The good news is that we have the holidays coming up, which I love, especially now because my brother will be coming home soon. Maybe even for Thanksgiving. At least I hope he does for my mom. My brother hasn't called home in a few weeks now and my mom just keeps talking about his grades and sleeping habits and the food he eats and my dad keeps saying the same thing. He's not going to get injured. Personally, I like to think my brother is having a college experience like they do in the movies. I don't mean the big frat party kind of movie. More like the movie where the guy meets a smart girl who wears a lot of sweaters and drinks cocoa. They talk about books and issues and kiss in the rain. I think something like that would be very good for him, especially if the girl were unconventionally beautiful. They are the best kind of girls, I think. I personally find supermodels strange. I don't know why this is. My brother, on the other hand, has posters of supermodels and cars and beer and things like that on the walls of his room. I suppose if you add a dirty floor, it's probably what his dorm room looks like. My brother always hated making his bed, but he kept his clothes closet very organized. Go figure. The thing is, when my brother does call home, he doesn't say a lot. He talks a lot about his classes, and mostly he talks about the football team. There's a lot of attention on the team because they are very good, and they have some really big players. My brother said that one of the guys will probably be a millionaire someday, but he's dumb as a post. I guess that's pretty dumb. My brother told this one story where the whole team was sitting around the room, sitting around the locker room, talking about all the stuff that they had to do to get into college football. They finally got around to talking about the SAT scores, which I have never taken. And this guy said, I got a 710. And my brother said, math 
or verbal? And the guy said, huh? And the whole team laughed. I always wanted to be on a sports team like that. I'm not exactly sure why, but I always thought it would be fun to have glory days. Then I would have stories to tell my children and golf buddies. I guess I could tell people about punk Rocky and walking home from school and things like that. Maybe these are my glory days and I'm not even realizing it because they don't involve a ball. I used to play sports when I was little and I was actually very good. But the problem was that it used to make me too aggressive. So the doctors told my mom I would have to stop. My dad had glory days once. I've seen pictures of him when he was young. He was, very, he was a very handsome man, and I don't know any other way to put it. He looked like all the old pictures look. Old pictures look very rugged and young, and the people in the photographs always seem a lot happier than you are. My brother, my mother, looks beautiful in old pictures. She actually looks more beautiful than anyone except maybe Sam. Sometimes I look at my parents now and I wonder what happened to make them the way that they are. And then I wonder what will happen to my sister when her boyfriend graduates from law school and what my mother's face will look like on a football card. My brother's face will look like on a football card or what it will look like if I never get on a fo- if he never gets on a football card. My dad played college baseball for two years, but he had to stop when my mom got pregnant with my brother. That's when he started working at the office. I honestly don't know what my dad does. He tells a story sometimes. That's one of the clues that we're looking at a memory. He tells a story sometimes. It's a great story. It had to do with the state championship for baseball when he was in high school. It was the bottom of the ninth inning, and there was a runner on first. There were two outs, and my dad's team was behind by one run. My dad was younger than most of the varsity team because he was only a sophomore, and I think the team thought he was going to blow the game. He had all this pressure on him. He was really nervous and really scared. But after a few pitches, he said he started feeling in the zone. When the pitcher wound up and threw the next ball, he knew exactly where the ball was going to be. He hit it harder than any ball he ever hit in his whole life. And he made a home run. And his team won the state championship. The greatest thing about this story is that every time my dad tells it, it never changes. He's not one to exaggerate. I think about all this sometimes when I'm watching a football game with Patrick and Sam. I look at the field and I think about the boy who just made the touchdown. I think that these are the glory days for that boy and that this moment will be just another story someday because all people who make touchdowns and home runs will be somebody's dad. And when his children look at his yearbook photograph, they will think that their dad was rugged and handsome and looked a lot happier than they are. I just hope I remember to tell my kids that they are as happy as I look in my old photographs and I hope that they believe me. Love always, Charlie. Now, I'm gonna pause reading here because I think I saw Charlie tell me a memory. He was actually talking about his dad's story, but he stopped the action of the book to tell us this memory. So let's take some notes. Let me get my note sheet back out. And I see Charlie tells the story of his dad's high school baseball game. Charlie tells the story of his dad's high school baseball game, and this happened kind of on page 52 and 53. So let me think about this. And I know um, whenever I see a memory, I need to ask myself this question, why might this memory be important? Why would Charlie have stopped 
talking about his friends, talking about high school, to tell us the story about his dad playing baseball. Um, and when I think about that question and why it might be important, I think that Charlie is really thinking about his future. It seemed like he really wants to do something that he can feel remembered for and feel happy about in the future. The memory that his dad tells about his baseball game is exciting for Charlie, and he wants to have a similar experience to tell his kids about. I'm thinking that maybe this will make Charlie start to try more things because he wants to have more exciting stories to tell his kids. Maybe he will start participating more like Bill tells him. Okay, my brain was doing a lot. Let's see if I can capture some of it in my notes. Um, so let me say this. This might be important. So this is what I ended up saying. This might be important because it seems like Charlie is wondering what memories he will have. I think he will try harder to make sure he has stories to tell. So by looking at this memory, I'm learning more about Charlie. I'm making some predictions. I am helping myself pull information out of the text, which is what I think the author wants me to do. Now, I am going to pause my reading here to you, and I want you to continue um, reading it on your own or using Learning Ally and looking for memory moments. Remember, you're not going to find one on every single page, but there is another one coming up pretty soon. It's on page 55, and I'm really interested to know if you can go in and find it. And when you do find it, make sure you ask yourself the question. Why might this memory be important? You can think about it and jot some of your ideas down right here. I'll take this sheet up from you so that I can see how your thinking is coming along. And just to review, today we learned another text clue that, um, called a signpost that authors give us. The name of this text clue is, you got it, Memory Moment. And readers, when you see the author stop the story to tell the reader about a memory, you should ask yourself the question, I heard you say it. Why might this memory be important? All right, so it's time for you to continue on on your own. Um, I want you to continue reading to page 75. Um, first, find that, sign, that memory moment on page 55. Then, as you continue reading, I want you to take signpost notes looking for both contrast and contradictions and memory moments. So we're kind of mixing now the two signposts that you have learned so far. When you get to the end of page 75, there's going to be a reader's response journal for you on Google Classroom. Remember, you only have to choose one of the reader's response prompts. And I want you to write at least 250 words. Try to use specific evidence from the book in your answer. It's been a pleasure being inside of your computer today and reading with you. 
I hope you're enjoying the book. I know I'm enjoying reading it with you. Um, and that is all. Bye-bye.